Hello, I'm David Kong. I'm a dedicated member of the Royal Hong Kong Yacht Club. I was past Commodore from 1996 to 1998, and this is my story. Welcome, David. It's a pleasure to have you, Thank you. Thank here you. today. Pleasure to be here. Doing a bit of my research before, I, I, I noticed that you joined in 1987, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, I did, yeah. yeah. And immediately, a year later, you were in GenCom, and suddenly, within less than 10 years, eight, you were a Commodore. That's meteoric. I didn't How do you feel explain that? that? I didn't yes, feel like that. Like a, I, I think look I, was, I was being asked to do this. I was uh, uh, looked at uh, Shelter Cove. I joined the Shelter Cove committee for a little while. I was just, people asked me to do things and I thought it was a good thing to do. <laughs> and I really didn't feel I was getting involved so much until I got asked to go to Gen Com. I said, you're really running out of people? <laughs> so that's how I got in. And I just, I, I've always believed that in my, in my whole life, a good part of my life should be putting back to the community and the things I like. So this is probably part of the uh, private part of the, my life. And little did you know that uh, the stars were being aligned and you were going to I think that's a conspiracy. It's definitely it a conspiracy. Nobody wanted to do the job. Tough. Yeah. Nobody wanted to do the job? Nobody wanted to do it, and then they said, you go, you go. <laughs> and why, 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 why you? I think in those days, in the old days, uh, ethnicity is, uh, is uh, needed in the club. Mm -hmm. Because in those days, there were predominantly uh, expatriates, yep. and um, very few Chinese locals were involved in, in the sailing community. Mm -hmm. So um, I was one of the few that followed Carl Kwok, uh, Li Fuk Hing, and a few prominent uh, sailors, Lowell including, yeah. um, to, to get involved with the club. And uh, I, I love organizing. I love teamwork. And this is why I like sailing, because every part of the team is an integral part of the, uh, of, of, of the work on the boat. So that's how I ended up. So, so indeed, sailing, how did you... Oh, start sailing. Oh, I started we'll, sailing. We'll, we'll get to the handover uh, later on. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I started sailing when I was living in Vancouver. I was brought up in Vancouver. I remember in grade nine, I think I was about 15, 16. And um, uh, a classmate of mine uh, asked me, would I help his father uh, build his boat in his backyard? This is in Vancouver. He had yeah. a hull, bought a hull and uh, put it in his backyard. And he asked me to sand and uh, do a little bit of woodwork and so on and so on. So at the end of the day, or at the end of the project, he launched the boat and I helped him uh, put the boat, uh, the whole family and myself was uh, uh, helping the boat in the water. And he asked me, would you like to sail? I said, I know nothing about sailing. And he was a racing uh, sailor. So uh, I got caught on into um, sailing. And I remember my first job was pulling the van. I didn't know what the van was like. Uh, and the good part was every part of the boat has a name. So there's communication is not a problem. If you say, oh, do that, pull this. Well, you don't. You, know, you pull a halyard, you pull something. So uh, that's why I really love about sailing. And so I got into that uh, sailing in Vancouver for several years and I left uh, after I graduated university to go work. To go work? Come overseas, here. overseas a few years. Yeah. I was in London, I was in Australia, I was in LA, and then, um, and then I was uh, asked to come back to Hong Kong to uh, start learning the family business of shipping. Right. Shipping in stevedoring, longshoreman, mm -hmm. logistics, now you call it. Right. So I landed here in 1981 and started working for the business. And how did you get into the club? What happened? Well, um, the first few years of uh, in the, in working here was very busy. I was uh, it was nonstop. It was uh, Hong Kong was booming, um, shipping was booming, logistics was booming, and, and we're very very busy. And um, after I started getting into the business and managing uh, to have a bit more extra time, I said, well, I needed some time to some recreation time. Work-life work balance comes into play. And I thought, well, what more can I do to go out but be on the water when nobody else goes? <laughs> because the, the, the traffic's super uh, jammed up going to the new territories yeah. to Repulse Bay on the weekend. So I thought the water was the way. So I managed to um, connect with a couple of friends who have uh, members uh, as their members' uh, friends in the club. 
And the first time I got was asked to sail with Lee Fook Hing on his little boat, True Love, which he designed and built himself. That's right. Yeah. 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 It, it was really fun. Um, Do you remember I, who your yeah, yeah. Uh, proposal was? Patrick Kwan, Patrick Kwan yeah. was, uh, was there. Margaret Chan was there. Um, certainly Lee Fook Hing. Yeah. A uh, few others, I can't remember, but we were always uh, thinking, wow, Frank Pong with his big uh, angelic and so on, that's the one that we want to go on, that sort of thing. Still until very recently, everybody wanted yes, still to go on yes, any of his yes, boats, Yes, right? yes, yes, yeah, it was a really great atmosphere. It was very friendly. Uh, everybody was on the same level. Um, and, and I love the connections in the Yacht Club because I'm in trucking. I'm a coolie. I'm a laborer in, in the warehouse. It's so oversimplified. Yeah, and, and yeah. I only know that part of the mm -hmm. industry, yeah. that part of the people in that industry. And when I come into the club, and I got to know Carl, for example, and he's wing on, right? And he does a whole different things than I do. And so it really opens up uh, quite a few doors uh, uh, into Hong Kong, yeah. Hong Kong life. Yeah. Especially after having spent so much time abroad and yeah, coming yeah, back. Yeah, and nice also it's just so busy. You, we're so focused on my business. I, I don't have time to look around. So the club gave me a huge door. Opening. And an appetite for boats because we went through the list. You had <laughs> a number of boats. You sailed yeah, I mean, you, you're saying yeah. you're Beneteau, Shabu Shabu, yes. Hocus So yes. probably the first ones that were really yours were well, the Hocus um, Pocus. Before, the, uh, the so experts. I decided to uh, go on doing water sports. So I, the first little boat was a 26-foot power boat, mm -hmm. uh, and it was like a, a speedboat. So I was able to go to Snake Bay or whatever for, for quickly. And then power boats, power boats. So uh, I thought, well, sailing was also, I was doing sailing as well. And, but the big move was in 1987 when I went into Simpson Marine and I said, I wanted a sailboat. Wow. And the late Robin Wyatt was the salesperson that I came across and he sold me a huge, in those days, was a 41 foot first 405, a Benefo first 405. And he was very good. He was, uh, telling me, I never owned a sailboat before, yeah. I sailed on it, um, worked on it, but I never uh, thought uh, someone like Robin would have been able to guide me through the equipment that was needed, uh, the gear, the rigging that was uh, for, for Hong Kong. Mm -hmm. um, for example, uh, the Benito has a standard mast, and he said, well, the Hong Kong light airs, you need a taller mast. So <laughs> it's that, a good salesperson. Like, yeah, he was really good. He was really good. And so that was my very first uh, sailboat. The experience yeah, you had. Yeah, did uh, quite I a owned uh, East Wind. That mm -hmm. was what it's called, East Wind, uh, several years, about three years. And then um, Mark Lees was part of my crew, and uh, he went and bought his own X412. It was called Shabu Shabu 5. And so we were competing for crew. I said, well, my boat's three, four years old. It's probably going to have a fairly good resale value. You never make money selling boats, but nope. that's what we thought. <laughs> so, uh, so I said, okay, well, I'll sell my boat and I'll go sail with him. With Shabu Shabu and Mark Lees, we did that for several years until he left Hong Kong in, I believe, 96. Uh, Nin retired, yeah, I think it was 96. Uh, he retired. 96. And is now in Seattle. We're still in touch. Yeah. And '96 is also the year where I was started uh, Commodore. Commodore. Right? Yeah, I was Commodore. Actually, the progress of becoming a Commodore, you got to go through Gen Com, get groomed, and then you um, get taken into the Vice Commodore position just to see how things are and yeah. so on. And who, was, who was the Commodore? Uh, the Commodore at the time was uh, an ICAC uh, top-notch uh, Tony Scott. Ah, okay, that's right. He passed away several years ago. Mm -hmm. And, um, and in fact, Tony was, uh, was uh, the one that was tangling with the ti royal title. And I sort of inherited <laughs> the problem, saying, who's going to succeed Tony, Tony yeah. at the time? And, because he was vice Commodore. And I believe it was Graham Jackson before him. Mm -hmm. He was Commodore and then Tony. And then 
Um, and they asked me to do this. I didn't know what was going on. I was young and innocent and naive. And I said, well, sure, okay. Yeah, uh, we have a good team. We have a good general manager. Everything's working, so shouldn't be a problem. So uh, I took on the vice president uh, position. The journey of the royal title mm -hmm. uh, started when Tony noticing that other royal clubs okay. were talking about dropping the name. The you know, golf club, the Royal Hong Kong Golf Club, obviously uh, the Jockey Club being part of uh, government interests and so on, uh, RSPCA, the other royal clubs were dropping their names like, like there was no discussion. It was like a natural possession, just drop it uh, yeah. because um, of the, yeah. It was a bit like the hot potato, you know? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. And Let's then, not and make then it was difficult for ourselves, yeah. Uh, there was an EGM uh, in the early days. I think it was about 95, uh, the first one. And although there was talk that there was uh, the need to drop the role, everybody understands, there's still a, a number of um, uh, members saying that, why should we drop the club, uh, the role? There's Especially no one was rather vocal, yes. who sadly passed away Ian, quite Ian recently, Dubin. Ian Dubin. Dubin yeah. Ian Dubin, yeah, he was very vocal. He was canvassing, he was lobbying and saying, no, we can't do this. We'll lose the uh, value, we lose the culture of the club if we drop the role. And so... And, and he, wrote, he wrote to Buckingham. Oh, yeah, I mean, yeah, we have yeah, that yeah, in, the, yeah, in the files. Yeah, I mean, yeah, uh, he yeah. was all, it's all there. Know, very it's all passionate there. about it. Um, very, very, very. And uh, there were obviously other uh, members that were very concerned about dropping the role. Mm -hmm. and, and purely because we had such a good club, why change everything by dropping the royal. They, they see that if the royal is not there, um, it's going to be completely changed. Mm. And also, if we don't have the royal title or the royal name, going into other royal clubs could be a little bit more difficult. Yeah. So um, the debate You're started. You're talking about the... The, the, like the, the royal the, yeah, club. Right, yeah. um, uh, the, uh, the clubs, normally you have a royal... Uh, membership card, a Royal Club membership card. You can go in the Royal Vancouver without yeah. any having any problems at all. Just yeah. go in. So um, a debate was uh, ongoing all the time, and then uh, obviously we had to make a decision to uh, take a vote. Mm -hmm. Now, under corporate law in Hong Kong, you need 75% majority to change right. anything, uh, uh, including the articles and yeah. so on. So. Um, uh, ongoing debate and then at the EGM there was a huge, I remember this, quite a long session of members standing up in front of the microphone saying why we should, why we shouldn't. And so at the end of that uh, we had to put in the vote. Mm -hmm. And I remember the first uh, EGM it was about 73 percent majority. So the majority of the members wanted to change, but there's still uh, not an insufficient number of votes yeah. to change. And um, one of the reasons is that the uh, more, I would say, longer standing members have, uh, are mostly full members. Mm -hmm. And the new members uh, sympathizing or recognizing that the need to change the royal name to a uh, normal Hong Kong name uh, were newer members. Right. And local members, right. and they're not. Uh, they're ordinary members, so they only carry one vote. So us with full or life members have 10 votes. So obviously um, it swings a little bit. Yeah. So it didn't go through. And um, again, so we go back to the drawing board, what are we going to do? Again, general committee and members, individual members canvassing and talking about each other and so on. And then I don't remember the duration, but before Tony Scott, retired as Commodore, he did another EGM. And this time, it was even more heated debate. <laughs> and Ian Dubin, dupes, <laughs> that particular meeting, he came in with a big violin case. Wow. <laughs> so we're saying, <laughs> what did is it this going to be a machine gun, <laughs> or is this actually going to be a violin? Yeah. So uh, he was uh, very vocal. Again, I mean, you had guns at home, so... <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so again, there was very, very he heavily debated in that EGM, and voting took place. Mm -hmm. Again, 70-odd percent, mm -hmm. just under 75%. So we couldn't change the name. So 
Tony says, well, I'm retiring as Commodore. Here's Is your it? baby. <laughs> so, Here's the hot potato. It's so yours. anyway, in, in, during the course, the club was running fine. Uh, we had a change of uh, general manager, a new general manager, Jethro Mahoney. Mm. He was a professional uh, club manager. Uh, unlike what we probably had before, it was, uh, um, I remember it was uh, John Newards mm -hmm. from the Armed Forces. And so the club was running fine, and we had our annual ball. It was really fun, a lot of sailing and so on. But this looming cloud over the club with the world title and the incoming handover in 1997 was coming. So I said, oh, what am I going to do? Not much we could do because we're going to say, if we're going to put another EGM, it's not going to get through yeah. uh, because the demographics of the club hasn't really changed. Everything was cruising along. Everybody's happy. And so something has to be done. And I remember one night I woke up. Well, I looked at the clock. It was between 2 or 3 o'clock or something like this. I said, I might have the solution because I was, uh, I was a little more familiar with the corporate um, laws of Hong Kong and I knew that being bilingual, Hong Kong registry can register Chinese and an English name. And I remember digging through uh, the archives of the club when we're looking at uh, renewing leases for here mm -hmm. as well as Shelter Cove and also expansion at uh, Midline for the Heart Stand and so on. I knew that the Royal Hong Kong Yacht Club only has an English name. And that was like 2 o'clock in the morning. I said, I better go in the morning and check with the general manager, do we have a Chinese name? I thought if we don't have a Chinese name, we might be able to break this deadlock, deadlock yeah. about the uh, royal title. And indeed, we don't have a Chinese name registered. So I proposed the general committee uh, after talking to Lowell and so on, and I said, look, rather than saying that we'll, we'll hold an EGM, rather than saying we're changing the name and dropping the royal name, we will register a new name, a Chinese name, Hong Kong Yacht Club. So, if we write uh, official letters to the government and so on and so on, we write in Chinese. And the letter would be Hong Kong Yacht Club. So there you go. So everybody was very happy. Threw that up in the uh, EGM, passed immediately. Wow. <laughs> that Fantastic. Was, that know, was really. Moses so, Vivendi. Yeah, yeah so there was big headlines happy. in yeah. the newspaper yeah. saying Royal, yeah. Royal Hong Kong Yacht Club keeps the keeps royal the title. Royal, yeah. And then I was bombarded by uh, the press and saying, what are you guys doing? Um, and I said, well, uh, this, 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 we're abiding the laws of Hong Kong. And um, if we deal with the government, we will use the Chinese language. After the registration, registration of the new name, uh, everything calmed down. But we had to deal with the outside. Uh, first of all, I had That's to write a, to the That's very queen. important, yeah. I had I wanted to, to get on to the that, queen. Yeah. The, uh, the private secretary of the Queen, because the Royal Hong Kong Yacht Club carries the Blue Ensign, which is the Royal Charter, and and that's because oh, uh, and because of that, the Navy, the head of the naval commander, has a spot in general committee Correct. here. He's a rear rock, commander, and so I had to write to the Queen, and the general manager Jethro and I thought, how are we going to word this letter to the Queen? and uh, the letters in the archives. We have them, they're going to be up in the, the new wardroom that we're redoing. Oh, we'll okay, have okay. Both. Okay, we'll okay. We'll have the, the 1950 patronage letter. Oh. And then the 1997, if yeah. I'm not mistaken. 90, 90, yeah, 97, 97. 97, reply from Buckingham. Yeah, um, yeah there was July 1997. There was a letter Agreeing to your suggestion. Yes, yes, and gracefully, yeah. being British and obviously the British is, is, is famous for, the, for their diplomacy. Gracious letter. Yeah, it uh, wrote was. back and said, congratulate, or, or we wish you all the best. The Queen will be very happy to accept uh, relinquishing. Yeah, the, the tone, re you're right. I mean, I, I encourage people when you have a chance to, to, to go yeah, out there and, yeah, and read it. it was, uh, because it, it, it's crafted in saying, look, look pinnacle we understand diplomacy. and we feel yeah. that you do whatever's yeah. best and we're very happy to support you in that decision. Yeah. There was no acrimonious, no yeah. feelings, no, it, very, yeah. very yeah, graceful. Very, 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 very well graceful. done from, from Buckingham Palace. Yeah. So, so again, the path was smooth, and so we sent back the, uh, we relinquished the Royal Charter, 
So we just uh, roll Hong Kong Yacht Club by title. But you, you make it you make it seem as it's that easy, babe. It wasn't that easy. There's all it wasn't issues. that easy. It was a lot of deliberations. I had good people yeah. around me. Uh, General Kennedy was very supportive of and, and suggestive. Um, uh, Lowell was very, very helpful because he knew a lot of people in the uh, Chinese uh, government mm -hmm. uh, and the Chinese representatives here. He was giving advice. He was uh, bouncing off advice, uh, suggestions for, uh, within the government and within the uh, new, uh, new China News Agency. But there were so also on. issues of, I, I, I love this word, vexillology, <laughs> right. which is a study of flags and the proper use of flags. And you touched on the ensign. And, and there, were, there were debates of whether we can still use yeah. that. Do we have to use the PRC flag? Yeah. Do we use the Bohemia and the PRC? I yeah. mean, yeah. it's well, uh, those we details. Have examples. Right? Yeah. We had examples because we're all Hong Kong Yacht Club had uh, uh, an emblem with a crown on top too, yeah. and they had to do something with it. So, but we didn't follow them, and we said, well, uh, we have to get away uh, from the crown, obviously. And uh, the Bohemia was, was a natural uh, replacement of the crown. And so uh, I remember uh, Lowell in his interview was saying, where did we put the flower, <laughs> right? So it was going to be underneath because of obvious reasons. And uh, it won't be on top because it looks lousy. And so we put it on the side. Mm -hmm. And so the logo or the emblem had the dragon mm -hmm. and the flower, Bahinia flower, uh, on the side. Now, here's another thing. Do we put English first? or Chinese first. So you look at the logo, uh, the emblem, it says R-H-K-Y-C, and then Hong Kong Yacht Club. Because in Chinese, you could write from right to left or left to right. So there's no precedence on who's running first or who's coming first, English or Chinese. So that's how we ended up. And we presented to the club. Great, no problem. So that was another uh, barrier overcame. And you did a big, a big uh, party on the yeah the uh, uh, I think handover was party, great party was with two handovers right yeah <laughs> <Or> hangovers <laughs> hangovers <laughs> it was I remember that month in July was really rainy it, it was, was wet, wet. <laughs> I believe you were there too and uh, everybody got wet we were in black tie um, Chris Patton was. Here I can't I can't remember. Oh, cool. There was there was a royal representative here, and uh, we did the uh, lowering the flag and, and raising the flag and, and so on. It was a wild party. It was really nice because all the uh, problems have been solved with titles, patrons, and, and so on and so on. And after that, it was an overnight one, an overnight party, even though we all got wet. <laughs> it was really really fun. Memorable. Uh, and thereafter, it was back to sailing and the club as usual. Back to sailing, yeah. There were some uh, uh, questions about who we're going to appoint uh, as patron to replace yeah. the Queen. Uh, I said um, to some of the press saying that, well, because the Queen was the head of state, naturally um, it would have been the head of state of um, China. Mm -hmm. And obviously, wow, that hit the, uh, that hit the press. And uh, was um, the well, Chinese premier? They felt. Yeah, was the Chinese premier uh, going to be asked to be this? And I said, well, um, we'll, we'll we'll research a little bit. So uh, Lowell and went and asked the uh, uh, the liaison office. Well, it's not a liaison office in those days. I can't mm. remember. It was the Chinese news agency yeah, in those days. And quietly he said, well, the Chinese government really have no interest in whatever you want to do yeah. and so well why don't we ask the um the also the chinese navy mm -hmm. because of the rear commodore that has a position well they said well they're not really interested you go ahead and do your own thing mm -hmm. so um and we went and asked uh tung Chiwa because he would have been the next choice and tung Chiwa says no he has no interest in doing yeah. this you just do your own thing so uh, it was very, very amicable, and we were left to do our own thing. Um, so that was the end of the uh, difficult times of uh, the royal. That's yeah, right. it was fun, fun. You also, under your tenure, you, you celebrated the first uh, gold medal 
for Hong Kong. Uh, Lee Lai San. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So, that was so really good. at least there was something we could give something honorary yeah, well, to someone. <laughs> she, yeah, it was sailing, right? Yeah. So, so although she was not that much involved with the club because of uh, windsurfing, mm -hmm. uh, we sort of adopted her. Mm. Uh, and into part of the water sports part. Yeah, that was. And she's still an honorary member today. Yeah. No, not yeah. that she patronizes yeah. the club quite a lot. But yeah, uh, yeah, no, no. She's uh, and and her husband Sam, Sam Wong mm -hmm. was also a champion uh, windsurfer at the time as well. Didn't win any gold medals, but he was uh, certainly top top dog in Hong Kong. Yeah, well, we fun. hope that we've got a few of our members, the, the yeah. young crew that just came back yeah. from Oman. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Hong Kong is spotting the uh, talents yeah. now, the Sports Institute, led by Tricia Lee. Yeah, she's right. uh, she's uh, really giving a lot of uh, leeway and a lot of encouragement. Yeah. Literally. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> so go, going back to sailing, so, you know, now you, you go back, you, you're no longer Commodore. Yeah, I was quietly uh, <laughs> sailing. I was asked sailing. to do, um, I remember I was uh, organizing chair of the China Coast Regatta. Mm -hmm. uh, I was doing this and that. I was a COA chairman for a little while during that time. And, uh, and then I quietly, as I like to be low profile, quietly uh, sailed. Sailed in the sunset. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Not quite, but um, uh, obviously I had my own boat. Mm -hmm. And around that time I had an X482. Yeah. Which uh, I think you, you, you campaigned her quite in a number yeah, of, of yeah, yeah, events, yeah. It was right? really the first boat that I took overseas yeah. or, or, or offshore yeah. and stayed offshore. Yeah. Um, uh, she was big enough and comfortable enough that we could race in the local regattas of uh, like the King's Cup, mm -hmm. uh, the Raja Muda, uh, the yeah, the Straits, uh, China Sea, obviously. China sea. And, and it seems that there was a, there was a lot. There was a Quorum Cup. There was yeah. there was the well, it was fantastic. The, Quorum you know, was, was such. So yeah, Kenwood uh, Cup a bit, so that was a bit in Hawaii, but the club used to participate or something. Yeah, was it? Yeah. So, so it, it, you know, do you think that those were a bit the heydays of big boat sailing in Asia or the club or maybe a, a golden period, which um, has yet to... Yeah, it was really days that we were really engaging in international sailing. Yeah. Um, we had boats coming into uh, the China Sea Race and we had boats coming into Hong Kong to the Corn Cup. Uh, unfortunately, big boat sailing, offshore sailing has sort of quiet mm. quietened down. Also because of the COVID, we, no, we yeah. can really knock back quite a bit. And you need a couple of owners, a few owners, you only need four or five owners yeah. that really have big boats that could really drive this. Mm. I remember when um, back in the 90s, late 90s, I had the 48-footer. Uh, uh, Peter Churchhouse, he had his Moon Blue One, mm -hmm. and uh, we were talking to each other. We were talking to Andrew Soriano, uh, a Andy Soriano down in the Philippines, uh, and we we're saying, "Hey, I'm going to go do this regatta. Let's go!" So mm -hmm. there was a bunch of boats, the big boats, about 50 uh, footers, who all go to do specific regattas. Mm -hmm. We did the President's Cup together. We did so all these boats move around, and I remember Peter and I sat down and said, "Well, we can't really race against." Um, quick boats, light light boats, and because we have boats that have air conditioning, we yeah. have refrigerators, so as you we, say, comfortable. Yeah, comfortable. <laughs> so, um, but we were matched against those boats, and we we're always last. I said, Peter, we got to do something about this. Off the side, we said, well, what we what we have is what we have called the furniture class. We have furniture, we have fridges, we have uh, air conditioning and so on. Lots of furniture class. So, Caravan. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> Pete, Pete, Peter and I were thinking, okay, well, the furniture class, we identify ourselves. So we were uh, bracketing what boats belong to this furniture class. And uh, we spoke to Mike Irwin of RRC mm -hmm. and said, Mike, identify a few things that we could classify these boats into a class of our own. And he did. He did. He did. It was a hull factor that he was fooling around with. Mm -hmm. I think it was a fall factor of nine and below, or something. I can't remember. Right. But anyway, so uh, so he created a it's furniture class. The rating for now, you guys. Peter and I we had to think about. We can't call this a furniture class <laughs> in a regatta. So Peter came up with a name. God bless him. The Premier Cruising Class. Yep. That's the name of it. It's a classy name that as. Peter is. And so we took on that. 
And uh, it's, there's still a remnant of the premier cruising uh, racing class in some of the regattas you see. But we had that class, we had like 12 boats in one in, in for several years that yeah. we went around different regattas doing that. And um, to do something like this, you need a couple of, uh, a few enthusiastic owners that yeah. would want to talk Who to each drive other. It, right? Yeah, buddies, and you say, let's go do this, and you have to take your own boat. Uh, something like that. It's all about canvassing and lobbying. In the meantime, I had an old boat called Mean Machine, yeah, Mum 36, yeah. brought that over, sold for nothing, like 20,000 US dollars. <laughs> and it was a great boat for Hong Kong. So I'm racing that with a big boat, yeah. and then I had. Um, uh, a trip 33, yeah. uh, which I bought from uh, off uh, Frank Pong. After that was a big boat I built in South Africa called Amity, a 78-foot uh, Ryko Pew. Wow. Never came to Hong Kong because of SARS at the SARS, time. SARS, 2003. Yeah, so yeah. I took it to uh, the Caribbean, sailed that a little bit. After 13 months, somebody just made me an offer I couldn't refuse, and I sold it. So I never came back to Hong Kong. After that head out of Africa. So what do you sail today? Well, I sail Quest. I share a boat with Helmut Hennig, mm -hmm. a very good friend of mine. His father and my father are buddies, so oh, wow. it's natural that we're buddies. And, <laughs> um, yeah, we, we sail Quest. Quest is, is a difficult boat to sail. It's a Mills 41. Mills 41, right. Uh, converted. Yeah. Um, uh, it's a very difficult. So it's a racing machine. It's a racing it's machine. It's not part it's of the furniture class. It's basically a surfboard. It's, it's not a, a part. Surf, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, um, we, we're still learning how to crank speed out of this, uh, how, to speed, how to point better, how to, how to sail faster. Every race, every time we go out, we find something. And we've owned this for almost three years. <laughs> so now that ambush is gone... I was going to say, yeah, what's happening? where's our competition? <laughs> so, well, you might, you might have a look at IRC too. There could be some interesting Yeah, 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 yeah. I think Drew and, uh, and uh, Joachim. And that yourself too. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The uh, Keep 31, Keep 31 right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah and a um, good friend of mine, uh, Alien Perch. Alien, yeah. So, um, yeah, uh, sailing has been really a good part of my, my, uh, my life. And, and one of the reasons is teamwork, obviously. Yeah. Everybody has a job, and, and a job well done is everybody's uh, job well done. And also, at the same time, kept my family together. Because when we go on holidays, I even have teenagers, they you stay on the boat. And when we, nowadays, they're, they're my, I have adult children now, they're 30 and 31. And I said, let's go on a holiday. As we go skiing or sailing, they drop everything. There's a question that has popped up after uh, Lowell's interview, and knowing that we were going to have you as, as one of our uh, interviewees. You had Lowell as a vice commodore. How was it? He was, he was wonderful, actually. Yeah. Very supportive. Yeah. Uh, came with advice at the right time. Uh, we worked together really well. I was uh, Commodore at the time he was Vice, and I was actually overseeing the process, uh, agreeing on the process, on the journey, how, uh, how we move forward. And he was the one that was digging around. He had a lot of contacts. I was just a young, innocent wow. guy. And he, he's exactly 12 years uh, older than All me. Right, yeah, yeah, because we, we knew each other uh, from uh, the same horoscope. And, uh, <laughs> and he, he had a lot of contacts uh, in government. Still has. And still has, still has. And so he was able to, once we have an idea, or several ideas, he'll go and ask for advice and, mm. and, and come back with a very solid uh, advice on and together we'll make a decision. We had a really good um, uh, Gen Com, uh, John Lee, mm -hmm. who was a um, uh, Commodore yep. after that uh, yep. as my onsec. Um, we had Charles Dixon, very sound and balancing act on the finances. Uh, we had uh, Wart Downs as our never heard of it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> as our recall Commodore Stanley. It was we had a really good team. Yeah, so... Um, a good team in very interesting times because you also yeah. had quite a number of things with the development, Shelter Cove, yeah, Middle Island. Yeah, yeah, so well, um, obviously on your it was not one Commodore's plate. job. Yeah. Uh, I think the whole thing for Kellett, um, uh, it was Frank mm -hmm. that really started uh, uh, paying attention on the development of Kellett because of the flyover that was being proposed. Yeah, that's right. And now it's a tunnel, which is good. Yeah. Uh, we thank him for that. 
we looked at Shelter Cove as a uh, big boat sailing center mm -hmm. and looked at uh, Middle Island as a training small boat rowing center. Uh, so we looked at how we can maximize the use of that. Uh, we had to look at uh, the lease because 1997, yeah. we had to look at this lease, we had to look at uh, Shutter Coast lease, we had to look at Middle Island's lease, but I only had two years. So it was before me and after me that this journey ended up. And I can assure are. you the story about the leases continues. <laughs> <laughs> yes, 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 yes. It yes. seems to be the light motif. Yeah, the yeah, cloud, yeah, right? yeah. Well, you have to be a bit more diplomatic now. You mm. have to be accessible by public and, and be seen and liked by public rather than just saying a bunch of expats used to be here and this is your spot. And nobody uh, says anything about well, it. It's a little different now. Everything has to be accountable. So how have you seen the, the club evolve over the last 25 years? Sailing continues to be, uh, rowing continues to be, paddling now. We never had paddlers yeah, in, in, right. in the old days, and now the, uh, the activities of rowing and paddling has uh, skyrocketed, yeah. which is fantastic. It's much easier to enter the club, uh, to join the club uh, through paddling, and because and you, you don't really have to beg people to go and uh, sail on this boat and so on. Um, um, more locals come in. Uh, which is which is great. Um, uh, the, the the club has expanded. There's a lot more members uh, using the club, and it's good that the plan was to expand the facilities, yes. the compass room, bistro, well on time, and um, we continue to be the best club in Asia, probably the biggest club in in the world. I think. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you.